This is Najma Minhas with Global Village Space. Joining me today, I have Mr. Mitha Ismail, who is the force and the face of PMLN's economic team. He is the former finance minister with uh, Prime Minister Shahid Kaka. Uh, Mr. Mifta Saab, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Mr. Saab, recently you've done a series of tweets on PTI government's performance for the past two years. What are the key issues that stand out for you? Uh, I think the most important statistic of any uh, economic, uh, uh, of any economy is, is to see what is the national income growth, what is, how are the incomes of people growing. And when we left, the income for Pakistanis, which is called GDP, gross domestic product, was, was increasing by 5.5% every year. Uh, this year, the percentage uh, increase is actually uh, minus 0.4%. So the economy is contracted by 0.4%. And, and this is obviously includes COVID effects. Uh, but even last year, the economy only grew by 1.9%, which is less than uh, the population growth. So that means that even last year, average Pakistani became poorer. And this year, even before COVID, it was not doing so well. And, and, and certainly after COVID, the economy contracted to 0.4%. And I think uh, some independent economists feel that it's probably close to minus 0.1%, but let's see. Uh, so that's the number one um, uh, concern that I have with the economy, that in a country which grows at 2.5% every year in terms of population, which sends 2.5% population or about 1.5 million people every year into the workforce, we need to grow by 6% or 5 to 6% just to absorb the new people coming into the labor market. And because that's not happening, because the economy is not growing, so unemployment is growing. So we have probably, even before COVID, added maybe 1.5 million to 2 million people into the roles of the unemployed. Since COVID, of course, more have gone in. And, and when you have 2 million people become unemployed, you, you know, multiply that by normally by 6 or by 3. So you will probably have like close to 6 million people who have been pushed below the poverty, uh, uh, poverty line which is about $2 per day, uh, which you would call abject poverty, you know. Uh, and obviously, you make millions food insecure uh, so that they don't really know where their next meal or the meal next week is coming from, and they have to make a choice between paying the children's tuition, their, you know, or, or paying for medical health, for uh, medical bills for what, their parents, or, uh, you know, paying the, 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 the bills for food rations. So, so that's the dilemma you force Pakistan. So that's the one concern. Uh, the second concern that I have is that when, when PTI came into power, we had a current account deficit and they make a very big deal out of the current account deficit as if that is the only statistic to worry about in the economy. But nonetheless, it was a large current account deficit, 6% of GDP, about the same as what, have, what uh, was in 2008. Yeah, by the way, when Shah Saab left and People's Party came first year, they also... 19 had... billion dollars. People said that this was at historically high levels. I mean, it was 19... I, like I said, 19 six, six, billion six, dollars. Yeah, yeah, 19 billion dollars, which is 6% of GDP. Like okay. 6% of GDP, right? Uh, and you measure these things in GDP, of course, like the US and many other countries run you know, much higher current account deficits, but, but the right. GDPs are much bigger, so it's not a big deal. Right. So this was about 6% of GDP. Like I said, 2008, Pakistan ran a similar current account deficit. In, 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 in 2016, 17, any number of countries actually had, you know, even higher GDP current account right. deficit. But this was a high current account deficit. So the first thing they did was to actually devalue the currency. Now, if you devalue the currency, two things really, obviously, two, two three things happen. One, you'll have a domestic inflation so that happened you know and that's understandable that if you're going to devalue the currency your imports are going to become more expensive and things will become more expensive right. so you'll have higher inflation that we understand mm -hmm. uh, the second thing that always happens is that your taxes go up tax collection goes up and the reason is that half of our taxes come from the ports right. so if you if your if your currency go, devalues so that even though the dollar value of imports went down the rupee value of imports actually went up Okay. And so if half of your uh, imports are, uh, half of your revenues come from the ports mm -hmm. and your import of rupee value, rupee value imports have gone up, you should have collected more taxes. Plus, because of the inflation that I just mentioned, mm -hmm. local goods also become more expensive. So rather than a, you know, a toothpaste which was selling for, let's say, 30 rupees, then they, they were paying 6 rupees in sales tax. Now it's 40 rupees, so they're paying 8 rupees in sales tax. So obviously, you know, for the same goods, you'll get more sales tax. Mm -hmm. So you should have seen an increase in revenue. 
Now, for two years in a row, they've actually revenues have not increased to, to what we left. Right. Uh, um, and so our last year's revenues actually, in, you know, was higher than their last, their first year's revenue. And even in the second year, they now claim that their revenue is a little higher than us by 100 billion rupees. But, but even that is not true. Because isn't that because to press demand, ETI actually implemented uh, customs duty, which meant the volumes of goods went down. And that's why we didn't see a raise in revenue in the customs, on the customs front, for example. No, but if you, if you have customs duty, that means that revenue should go even more. Plus, if at the stage of imports, you collect 5 to 6%, depending on the goods, uh, something called withholding tax. You know, uh, and, and so that's uh, there. Then you have sales tax of 17% on, on all goods and services which are imported. So really, by any measure, anywhere in the world, you'll see wherever there is devaluation, you will see an increase in import, an increase in taxation. That didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the third thing that, uh, that, that uh, was an effect of devaluation that you expect is that when you have devaluation, you will, you've made Pakistan 40% cheaper, our okay. goods and services 40% cheaper. So you should see an increase in exports. Now, PTI, obviously, as you know from the campaign, used to speak a lot about Muslim League not being able to do as well in export as they should have, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And so they were, we, they were criticizing us a lot. Well, it turns out that in their first year, after a devaluation of 40%, their exports were actually less than us by $500 million. This is first year, this is not even COVID. And this year, of course, with the COVID, the exports are less by a couple of billion dollars or a little bit more, but you know, let's just forget that. But even the first year, the exports were not. So the three effects of devaluation are two positive and one negative. We got the negative effect of inflation, but not the two positive effect. How do Another you, thing that I, because you also, I, I read a very interesting article you wrote in 2018 in the news, where you actually um, subtly criticize your own government for delaying devaluation and saying we should have done this in 2016, uh, but we've now, we, we delayed it until 2018, and we should have done this because, in essence, State Bank was subsidizing our imports and our exports suffered. So you would have liked to have done the same policy. Well, how do you explain that their exports have not gone up then? How is it their fault? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, I think that the PTI can expl explain their own failures much better than I can. Uh, but what no, I but as an opposition, you have a, a perspective on this, right? I mean, you know, I have a perspective. I have a perspective, you know. But but and the perspective is that one, uh, the devaluation was done in a very haphazard and a very clumsy manner. I mean, a huge devaluation. And then if you remember when the rupee was 125, there were PTI ministers saying, oh, we'll see 140. You don't say this in government when you know that you will devalue because you're the few ministers, you're giving markets the wrong signal. Then you've seen it went to 140, came back to 128. The prime minister saying, I did not know this. You know, the finance minister saying, no, I told him. You know, all sorts of confusion. Even today in the last week, the, you know, the currency has gained about 5%. I mean, you know, you, so there's something to be said about stabilizing currency. I mean, look at the UAE and, and Saudi Arabia. You know, for 20 years now, they have the same rate of 3.65 or whatever. So, th so that was, that was the one we thing. We don't have any kind of economy where we can use our resources our FX reserves to stabilize the economy. I mean, this is one of the criticisms your government has got from experts that we yeah, use I, FX no, reserves. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm saying that you need to stabilize these things. Okay. Uh, so when you go from 140 to 128, then the next day again to 140. And if, if, if we had done this, you know, they would have been crying, oh, this is a rigged market. They're making money. And you know, there is this account. I'm see, obviously buying, asking for receipts. It's not in fashion in Pakistan anymore. But, 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 you know, but, but, I mean, just think that, you know, how many times the currency has up and gone up and down. Then you have to understand that there is a lag. Just because you devalue today doesn't mean that your exports will increase tomorrow. Right. So this was a crazy thing to devalue like this, like crazy like this. So they imported inflation into Pakistan and were not able to ex increase exports. One of the things that I did, and, and uh, Isaac Dar Saab did before me, but in the last two years, when we saw that our exports were not moving and we understood that there are structural issues, not just the currency issue, but yeah. there are structural issues, which PTI is only now recognizing, but we sort of understood this a couple of years before that, that we started giving rebates, knowing that our power and energies, our power and gas is more expensive than India, Bangladesh, Vietnam, other countries that compete with us. We were giving them rebates 5%, 3% for, for you know, targeted exports. PTI came and dismantled the whole thing. And then they also increased the price of exports uh, of uh, price of gas and utilities. So the, the, so the, the only advantage the exporter had from the devaluation of the currency was the fact that you had made your 
workers poor when you were giving them 15000 rupees which was 150 dollars you know during our time now you're giving them 15000 rupees which is about 90 dollars so you've made the workers poorer and in that advantage accrues to the exporters but you made the visually more expensive gas more expensive all sorts of things and so no advantage accrued to the exporters plus you did away with the uh, this dismantling of the we did just dismantle the whole structure of export rebates the dars have understood that you know there were structural issues that we need to you know support exports and we were able to in my in, in our pmlns last year we were able to export increase by 13 percent uh, and these guys then came and dropped the exports by two percent so so these are the my primary c c concerns about uh, pti's economy and just one other thing um, and as you remember that pti was uh, you know always criticizing us and khan sahib even after he assumed the government was talking about uh, the debt taken by the democratic dispensations, you know, People's Party and PMLN since uh, Professor Musharraf Saab left. Um, and I always believe that rather than doing a 2008 to 2018, you know, that uh, commission that he formed, which has not reported, by the way, and uh, I wonder, can wonder why they haven't reported yet. Uh, but I thought that, you know, if they did the last year of Parvez Musharraf, you know, the 2007, 2008, and a couple of years of Imran Khan, you know, I think that people will really understand this. Now, PMLN took 10,000 10, billion rupees, about 10,300 billion rupees, and grossed that in Pakistan. PTI has actually, in two years, gone 11,000 billion rupees, much more debt than we did in, you know, in, in five years. And, and, and so this whole, this notion that somehow, you know, we were stealing money and then somehow we were being, you know, playing loose with people's money and then not, not austere enough, this has all gone out the window. Uh, so, what are you doing when you're raising the debt to GDP ratio so crazily that they are doing and now they're putting the back to, the debt to GDP ratio is in dollars, right? So, when your dollar devalues, by definition, your debt increases, right? So, when you, no, you can do this in also, you, no, 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 you, you, you debt to GDP ratios you can do in rupee. In fact, and your rupee, rupee debt became more expensive when you raised interest rates. Yes, and they raised interest rates, and now they've raised interest rates. They've, they've, They've brought back interest rates and, and, and look, the skies have not fallen. I don't know why there is interest rate by so much. And, yes. and when we were, they were criticizing us for borrowing dollars for 6%, 7%, now these guys are borrowing at 13%. And, and the debt, let me just say the rupee, the debt is, can, is done in the one ratio I'm talking about is done in Pakistani rupee. And even this uh, notion that PTI gives that the debt has increased because we have devalued, even this is faulty. Only 25% of Pakistani debt, when I left office, was in dollars. 75% was a rupee-denominated debt. So don't say to me the debt has increased because we have devalued, because that's only 25% of the debt. The 75% of the debt is only rupees. So I would like to ask you, because you started off by saying that devaluation was too extreme too soon. Um, by the time you left in 2018, the rupee had devalued from 105 to around 150. During the interim right. government, it went to around 130 in the, um, in the market, in the open curve market. And then since then, obviously, we've seen another 35 rupees over the last two years overall. How would you have managed the exchange rate differently, given the fact we have no foreign exchange reserves? When you left, foreign exchange reserves at the State Bank were only $12 billion. Okay. And we had um, and $9 billion coming up in that year that we had to pay. Okay. Every, every year we have this money and every year we have to read all this thing. To see this idea that PTI says that we have to borrow money to pay, repay the debt, obviously. I mean, every government has had to borrow money to repay the previous government's debt, but you also get previous government's assets. Um, and they've borrowed a lot more. I mean, you know, so when their when they're ministers or, you know, when their economic ministers talk like this, that, oh, we've written 500, 5 billion rupees dollars back, mm -hmm. that's shameful because they've obviously gotten 35, you know, billion and they've paid 5 billion back. So the net net, and we're only talking about the net number. So now that's a very valid question that how would we have dealt with it? Uh, just one small correction. When I left, the rupee was 115. When the caretakers left in, in 30th June, for instance, the rupee was 122. And then they also got PTI in July, August. The rupee was about 122, 124. And then they started the devaluation. Although it had gone to 128 by, during the election in the interim government period, but it was pulled back. Now, uh, I, my idea was that, you know, just in my head, and maybe, you know, I discussed with the Prime Minister at the time, that, you know, maybe at the end of the year, we will see at the end of uh, December, we will see 120, 125. Certainly by June, we were thinking of 130. That was in my head. I wasn't talking to anybody, and I was certainly not saying this on TV. 
Now I want to go take you back to April of 2018, when Swiss uh, Credit Suisse uh, they, they had lent us 400 million dollars, mm -hmm. and the money was due, and we just re-rolled that 400 million dollars. In May of 2018, the month we were left, uh, Citibank uh, came to us and said that they want to borrow, lend us two billion dollars, two billion additional dollars. And they were lending us at 8%. And I said, that's too high. I don't want to borrow right now. And I said, you know, let the caretakers or the new government decide. I don't want to decide. You know? So in April and May, they were willing to get, lend us so much money. Now, in, in, in July, August, PTI comes in. Asad Umar says, Pakistan is at the edge of bankruptcy. Razak Daud says, Pakistan is about to default. No, Pakistan was not about to default. Pakistan is not even defaulting now when the debt to GDP ratio is so high. Pakistan has not defaulted in 70 years. We're not about to default. We were growing very high, you know, and, 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 and lots of world was willing to invest. Asad Umar never used the word bankruptcy when he was head of Engro, okay? Even though Engro was the most leveraged company in Pakistan. Descon also lends, borrows money, Razak Daud's company. They don't use these words default and bankruptcy when they're talking about their own companies. Why are they talking about this? When they're talking about my country, you know, a country which has not defaulted in 70 years, their own finance minister and commerce minister saying they're about to default, who's okay, going to lend you money? Okay. Why are you blaming Asad Omar for that time? I remember that in June that year, Moody's, uh, the rating agency, actually downgraded Pakistan. Pakistan went from being stable to negative, right? So already the international market and our credit default swaps were actually increasing tremendously. So therefore, I'd say that international markets were already recognizing that we were living off borrowed time. So my question back to you once again is, how would you have maintained the exchange rate? First of all, uh, I, think, I think the ratings were downgraded from uh, positive to neutral, not from neutral to negative, but I could be wrong, you know, which you can say. The, secondly, uh, if you look at uh, the bond market, Pakistani bonds, you know, international markets, they were not selling at discount, okay? In, in October, November of this year, and nothing had changed since October of 17, November of 17 to the May of 18. In fact, our exports had done actually well. We devalued a little bit, you know. So uh, good things had happened. In October, November, October, November, I myself, along with the then Governor State Bank, Tariq Bajwa Saab, then Secretary Finance, Raiz Banu Saab, went to New York and we sold two and a half billion dollars worth of Pakistani bonds. We mm -hmm. were still able to get money. For, for our own finance minister and for our own commerce ministers to use these words, for our own prime ministers to go and say, all oh, Pakistan is just corrupt, only the only Imran Khan is only, you know, uh, this blessed being from heaven, everybody else is corrupt. I mean, for them to go say this, for ministers to say, oh, the currency is going to devalue, this is how you destabilize Pakistan. Otherwise, the economy was growing at five and a half percent. There was no reason. Look at it, look at where we are today. Our, our, our reserves are no better. You know, we've borrowed a lot more. We've borrowed from friends that has, has affected our foreign policy and the economy is not moving. Okay, so if it's us, I'd just like to ask you there because you know, right now we have just had a current account surplus after a very long time, right? Um, now let's go back to exports. One of the biggest issues, obviously, you, you recognize yourself is not just the devaluation, it's the structural impediments in exports. What are the structural impediments that you think that the government should be working on, which we have not been able to do so far? And which you yeah, would do if you were in government today, for example? The, the last time I think we had an export uh, current account surplus, monthly, one month current account surplus, I think it was October 2015. I could be wrong, but you know, so uh, now, of course, PTI has had a current account surplus. So this is like heralding something new that, you know, uh, you know, this is the best thing since, since sliced bread. But I mean, PMLN also had in 2015 a current account surplus, but none, the media was not so ecstatic about this. And not. But we've had COVID. Let us celebrate something, please. Let us celebrate. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I mean, celebrate. You know, and 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 let me just say one one positive thing. The one thing that's really happened, which I'm very happy about, is an increase of about 500 million dollars in the last two months each. Uh, of remittance, and I hope to God this this trend lasts. I don't know why this has happened. You know, maybe if it lasts one or two, three months, people will figure out. Smarter people will figure out what's changed. But 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 this is a really good news. So that's a positive news. Uh, On export what, policy, tell me what you would export, do. Export is structural is structural impediment. Like I mean, one thing I said to you uh, earlier on was that. What Dars have understood, and I think maybe I understood, was that because our the power and utility rates are more expensive than our neighboring countries, uh, so that we need to give them rebates. Also, Pakistani markets are very, very 
narrow. We sell to some European countries in North America, and that's about it. Uh, our goods are very narrow, you know, textile and a few other things, and that's about it. So we need to make it more export friendly. There are certain structural issues. Uh, ours is an import substitution policy in the government, where we'd like to have these big, huge factories, um, you know, making things which are difficult to compete with with China. But I mean, if you look at Bangladesh, Vietnam, and all that, these guys have grown based based on sewing machines, you know. Right. Uh, so, but for sewing machines, you need to have better security. You know, you need in in one of the reasons Bangladesh has actually done so well in exports in other countries. I'm sure you'll also find it also find the data, I don't know about the data there, is the female participation in the labor force. Mm -hmm. Bangladesh has a lot more female participation in the labor force. That's why their wages have not increased. The real wages were actually below Pakistan at that point when we were in power. And yet they, you know, they were exporting more. In Pakistan, you know, the wages have, were higher because there's much fewer, much lesser uh, female right. participation in the labor force. So, so I mean, and, and, and these are obviously cultural issues and, you know, mm -hmm. other issues. So these are not easily dealt with in, with in economic policy. I can't tweak a budget and say, well, from, from tomorrow, a lot more women should work. Or I cannot tweak a budget and say, that, you know, but but uh, I think that power generation and power distribution, when we came to, uh, in government in 2013, there was hardly any power in Pakistan. You know, Punjab, there was load shedding, you know, every hour, not just in Punjab, in all of Pakistan, except maybe Karachi was a little more lucky. Uh, now, of course, Karachi also has a considerable amount of load shedding. The load shedding was a big issue. Um, then the energy is expensive in Pakistan compared to other things, much more, much less efficient. We have, for instance, um, right now we have 19% line losses, uh, transmission and distribution losses. Mm -hmm. Internationally, it's 11 to 12% of countries which are at our level of socioeconomic development. More developed countries actually have lower. Right. Uh, when we got in, we got in at 22%. We brought it down to 18 uh, in, in PTI's government, this has gone up by 1%. Uh, when we were collecting taxes, uh, bills at 93% when we left, again, when we got in, it was 84%. We brought it to 90%. It has gone down now to 80%. So the government has to try and go back to where we were. Plus, now they've done some agreements with the IPPs and all that okay, stuff. On the IPP, uh, I'd like to ask you, because that obviously is a very important thing for all of us, and you've mentioned the importance of power and the cheap power as well. Your government signed very expensive contracts with IPP, which obviously the government, we've been lucky enough, they, they were able to renegotiate, and at the same time set a much lower dollar rate on which the payments will be made at 148, when dollar currently is around 166. Um, how did your government end up signing such expensive uh, rates when it was obvious, for example, the LNG, the LNG contracts, it was really obvious and experts at the time were saying that gas prices are going down. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Actually, no, no, the, the premise of your question is actually uh, fortunately not true. Hmm. Uh, the, the two agreements that the government of Pakistan has signed, one is for the 2002 uh, power policy, which was set up in Parvez Musharraf's time. Mm -hmm. You realize that at that time, Nawaz Sharif was uh, not in Pakistan, and he exerted very little policy influence. So we cannot really blame Nawaz Sharif uh, for the power plant set up in 2002 to 2004, right. Right. Which, which is one of the things. The second power plants that they've actually agreed to is, are the power plants that are that have been signed, uh, that have been set up during 1994 when Mohtarma Benjir Bhutto was in power. Again, you cannot really blame Nawaz Sharif, you know, okay. for that. So these are the two ones. So the agreements that have been signed in our government, actually, the Bikki Baloti Haveli agreements that we have signed, are actually owned by the government of Pakistan, two by the government of Pakistan, one by the government of Punjab. So whatever you know tariffs that you are giving, if you're paying access to the you know to the you are actually paying to the finance ministry of Pakistan. So so really, I mean, if you want to bring it down to one 15 percent return or 14 percent return, you know how I mean. In fact, when after we set up all these power plants, which we really needed to, we just that said that from now onwards. Uh, there's not going to be a fixed uh, uh, return on investment, but we are going to actually be, have people bid so that real market rates can come down, maybe even less than 12%. That's one thing. LNG, you ask, uh, uh, and, and since I've spent time in jail because of this, uh, not because of this, but because of because of the fact that I don't shut up enough, I suppose. Um, but but uh, in Pakistan, it signed an agreement in, the gen in January of 2016 uh, with Qatar Gas. And, and in December with Gunvar. And we did an open bidding. 
and we got a price of 13.37% of Brent. Uh, when Gunvor got the lowest bid, the second highest bid was uh, by Shell. And we said to Shell that if you match Gunvor's price, we will also give you orders and they refused to match. Mm -hmm. This was how tight the pricing was. Qatar then finally agreed after much uh, discussion to 13.37. A month later, a month later, India signed and to this day, India is buying more expensive gas than we are. Mm -hmm. So if we were corrupt, then Nawaz Sharif uh, and, and his team was corrupt, then obviously Indian teams were also corrupt because they actually are paying much lower than us. 75% of gas in the world is sold on long-term contracts. Nobody right. at the time was saying that this was an expensive. I mean, there are these idiots, you know, who, without knowing anything, will say, well, you're brown manga, Lelia, chori Kerli, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you talk about serious people, nobody said that this was more expensive. And look at the contracts signed by other countries, by Japan, Korea, India, Bangladesh. Bangladesh signed a year later than us and still is buying more expensive gas than us. And as the oil prices have come down, crashing, the price of LNG has also come down. Right. And today, the LNG that we've imported is cheaper than the local gas that you buy. You're paying $5 and some cents in Karak and Kohart, that agreements that you'd sign in Sharaf's time, Sharaf Saab's time, and, and our LNG is actually cheaper than that. Number two, these were, this was just one last point. This was once in a lifetime opportunity that they could have bought gas on spot at $2, $2.20, $2.30. These people did not buy gas, LNG, and instead they were importing furnace oil and they were running plants on diesel. This is criminal. That is, this, is, this is criminal negligence. They were probably worried about the map case um, being made afterwards. You never know. Okay, so I'd like to ask you two more things. One is the uh, revenue minus expenses that Pakistani government has. And the issues, obviously, we've had for decades. Uh, the fact that um, we have a negative revenue fiscal deficit. And the, what I want to get your thoughts, A, on the NFC, which is a big now, becoming a huge factor in this thing. And secondly, on the pension issue. Uh, which we've recently seen a lot of numbers come out, which are telling us it's becoming unsustainable. What is PMLN's issue? Do you in, uh, stance on this? Do you intend to work with the government on tackling pension issues? Because this is going to become a problem for every government going forward. And let me start with the, let me start with the budget deficit and NFC question. NFC um, gives about fifty-seven point five percent of monies to the province. And, and for federalism, I understand that money should be, the, the, the power should be devalued, should be the provinces. In fact, I think that that's actually not worked out really well. We should actually devalue further to the local governments. Okay. Uh, one of the under, things that you understand in fiscal federalism is that, you know, if you are going to have authority to spend money, you should also have the responsibility to raise revenues. So, so the local governments and provinces should try and raise some of their own revenue. The issue right now is the government of Pakistan and four four plus one governments of Pakistan plus AGK and GB, they spend about 11,000 billion rupees and they only raise about 6,000 billion rupees. So, so there is a huge deficit. Then even with this NFC award, somehow PMLN was able to keep the deficits under 6.5%. PTI has not been able to manage it. And uh, in, in the last year's deficit was 9.1%. This year they're claiming to be 8.2%, but I think it's more. Uh, so, 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 even even with the NFC award or without the NFC award, there is no substitute for good management and, and, and fiduciary duty which they have neglected. But NFC award, I think, has to be revisited. You, it's important that we spend money on provinces, absolutely, in education and health. But you cannot back up the federation. You can, I mean, you cannot have a feder weak federation and then strong provinces. That makes no sense. So, I think that provinces and all stakeholders need to sit together. Come up with a viable plan so that you make provinces uh, whole, but you also make the federal government whole. This is a very unsustainably high federal deficit, which I think is not sustainable. And I think that there has to be some changes in this. As far as pension is concerned, I think there was some um, stuff happened a few years back. I think during Musharraf Saab's time, uh, where these pensions were allowed. Now they're about 400, 350 billion rupees, and they're going to keep going. If we don't fund these pensions. One of the things we should require is that this year's the pensions accrued this year should be funded by the government, you know, and, and put in some sort of a, uh, like the U.S. It has a social security, some sort of a social security thing. Um, we can also, for so future people employees... People all require the opposition to work with the government, right? Uh, if the government does it, then today the policy is made, tomorrow the policy is overtaken. How do we try and get 
the opposition to work with the government so that we get sustainable policies for the nation. Now, one more issue I'd like to bring here is PSM, Pakistan Steel Mills and Pakistan State-Owned Enterprises. You guys in 2015 did a fantastic in initiative, as far as I'm concerned, which is closed down P PSM, okay. Pakistan Steel Mill, because it was running losses of billions of rupees and you know, millions of dollars by this stage, and it wasn't in anyone's benefit. However, this year when Pakistan uh, P PTI gave them the golden handshake under S Supreme Court uh, uh, rules as well, you came out and opposed this. And I was really surprised because you were in favor. You, I mean, your, your whole team was saying, we need to do this. We need to privatize uh, PS PCM. And yet now you're not supporting the government. Now, is this because you don't believe in the vision or is this because this is just, you want to be opposing everything PTI done? Yeah. No, this is not the policy of PMLN. We are not, we are better than PTI. PTI was used to oppose it. If you remember Imran Khan and uh, Arif Alvi Saab and Asad Umar Saab went to uh, Pakistan Steel Mill and they were doing this. Jalsa and at one Mr. point- Mr. I, Mr. let's forget this. Let's talk about the no, nation no, right no, now. We, no, no, let's, no, no. They made those it's statements. Very important. We've all seen the no, video, no, right? So no, I agree no, no, I, I, with you. Abhika, what anyway, are we going to do now though? That's I, the question. No. I, I think I think we are ready to forgive them, but we're not willing to forget. I think that it's important to remember the historical context of this and then to understand that whereas PMLN's politics is of constructive nature and PTI's was not. OK, so the, these guys, the guys were the ones who were actually playing politics with it. And they went and I just tell you that one speech I was telling people that, look, you, you guys, and this is oh, you and my, my money and your money and, and everybody else's money, that we are losing forty five million dollars in PIA every year. You're losing incredible amounts of money in PSM, and they both have negative equities. Okay? If you actually try to sell them, you'll get no money, you know, if, if, exactly. uh, as is. So I actually joked to somebody that, you know, if somebody buys P Pakistan Steel Mill, I will give them PIE for free. And to this day, you know, P the, you know PTI supporters are actually, hey, well, you're going to give them for free, as if, as if actually it could happen. But if somebody were to buy it, I mean, sure. The point is this. Uh, we believe in privatization. We think that privatization should be the agent of growth, not to close it down. There are some issues with the PCA, PSM. The, they've closed it down. I would have just said that instead of closing it down, first at least try. Asadumar used to say that, you know, once we will come back, all of these things will be turned into profit and we don't know how to do this. And somehow, supposedly, it was Nawaz Sharif's mill on, in space and Mars and, you know, run with Hindu agents in Israel and Israeli agents in India that were doing all of those things. But, I mean, now, obviously, you know, we have these, you know, you know, leaders who, 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 who have mana from heaven in their pockets, why is this not running in a loss? Why are you shutting it down? Why aren't you privatizing it? So our idea was that you just privatize it. We would not oppose the privatization, either of PIA or of uh, steel mill or of any discos, distribution companies. And I still honestly believe that the only solution to circular debt is to privatize distribution companies or of any other number of enterprises public center. Whatever PIA wants to private, uh, PTI wants to privatize, we will be supporting them as long as it is done in transparent uh, in, uh, manner. Uh, but when, when the markets are down by 30%, real estate markets are down by 30% in New York, and all of a sudden you, it occurs to you to, to privatize Roosevelt Hotel, then you know, given their track record, one has to you know, question their wisdom. Mr. Sub, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you.